Hello everyone, welcome back, and this will be our last video on inheritance patterns uh, regarding genetics. We're going to talk about pedigrees in this video. A pedigree is a chart that helps track which members of a family express a particular trait. And when we look at pedigrees, we're not going to be looking at anything just basic like freckles or hair color. You could, but these types of charts are more used to look at diseases or some other types of uh, traits that you might not want to actually inherit. And you want to keep track on what the likelihood is of you passing that on to your own children. So down below here, this is a pedigree right here. It's a very basic. It doesn't get much simpler than this. But when we look at a pedigree, we first have to get accustomed to using some basic symbolism. So the first is a male is going to be represented as a square. So you can see in this pedigree here, I have one, two males. Females are going to be circles, one, two in this pedigree again. If you're normal, you're just going to be an empty circle or square. That means you simply do not express whatever the trait is. Let's pretend we're trying to look at if people have color blindness. So this female and this male right here would not have it. All right. But if you are a carrier, you will be half shaded. Um, either a circle or a square. Now, in this pedigree, I'm not showing you who the carriers are. But if you're an affected individual, that means that you are going to be fully colored in like you see this female down here. So these two people, one, two, would be the children of these two original parents, the mother and the father up above. There is a daughter, obviously, here. Uh, put a little star here, who is affected. So that means, depending on what type of trait this is, she either got it from both parents or she only inherited it from one. So it's all a matter of, is this a sex-linked trait or an autosomal trait that we're looking at? And that's going to be one of the really the hardest things that we have to deal with when working with pedigrees. But I'm going to show you how to work through that. So again, males will be squares, females circles. If you're affected, you're fully colored in. If you're normal, you're not colored in. If you are a carrier, which you'll hardly ever see, I'm going to want you to figure out who the carriers are. They would be only half shaded. All right. If an individual couple is married or have a relationship together, uh, you will see a horizontal line connect them. So right here would be a marriage. doesn't necessarily have to be a marriage, but most times that's what that is what that symbolism represents. But it could be two individuals who just happen to be living partners and they also still have two children. Some other symbolism you might see, but um, in any type of pedigree, you're probably not going to see those in any of the ones I show you today. But you might see a diamond pattern that is a person whose sex is not known. Uh, that simply means they probably died and there is no record of what their sex was. This could have been 100 years ago. You know, your great, great, great grandparents um, on record had a child that was stillborn, but it was not recorded if it was a boy or a girl. Again, here is a marriage. Two lines connecting each other would be a consanguineous marriage. That means incest. Again, a vertical line coming off a marriage line represents children. Here, this couple here have had one, two children. And then here, you have fraternal twins or non-identical twins. See how they branch off separately at the same point? That means that a twin set of a, both a girl and a boy were born at the same time. If they're identical twins, there's going to be a, heart, there's going to be a vertical line that comes down first before a splitting into two of the same exact sex. So if I were to draw this up here, let's see, there's a line that comes down and then splits. These would be identical twin boys at that case. All right, while this right here would be fraternal twins. Now, these are the rules that you have to memorize and understand. When you look at a pedigree, the first question you want to ask yourself is, is this pedigree showing me a trait that is autosomally inherited? That means on any of your first 22 pairs of chromosomes. Or is it sex link, meaning it's only found on either the X or Y chromosomes? Now, here's the guidelines that I want you to follow for every single one. First, if most of the affected individuals, that means the individuals colored in, are male, 
then it's most likely an X-linked trait. Now, there's no guarantees here, all right? You could think something is an X-linked trait. It shows that it is based on the rules I'm showing you, but it could just be a fluke where it actually is an autosomal trait. But for our purposes, this will work out just fine. So to stick with if it's sex-linked or not, look at this. If it's at least three males to one female ratio affected, call it sex-linked. Or if it's all males affected, it's sex-linked. Because remember, males are affected more often than females because they only have one X chromosome when it's a recessive trait. So we're going to look at either everybody affected in the pedigree is a male, or you have at least a three males to one female ratio. If you had two males to one female, you're, you're getting too close to 50-50, so it, it could be autosomal or sex-linked. You're not really sure. But if it's sex-linked, that means you're going to have to use X's and Y's in your genotypes. If it is an autosomal trait, that means you're going to have at least a or close to a 50-50 split between males and females affected. Like I said, uh, two males uh, to one female or two males to two females. Or if only females are affected, then it's automatically autosomal. It's not going to be sex-linked because the odds of only females getting it with a sex-linked trait are pretty much zero. So what that means is if you find out that it's a sex-linked trait, you're going to have to write your genotypes like this. If you determine that it's an autosomal trait, well, then you're back to the standard form that we've been doing since the beginning of this unit weeks ago. Second question you want to ask once you determine if it's autosome or sex-linked is, am I looking at a trait that is dominant or is it recessive? If it's a dominant trait, one parent must have the trait and you will most likely see it in every generation. That means if a child has it, at least one of their parents had to have it. And if one of their parents had it, one of their grandparents had to have it. It has to be seen in at least one parent in every generation for it to be dominant. If you see just one individual in the entire pedigree whose parents are not affected and it's skipping a generation, that makes it automatically a recessive trait. So if we see it in every generation, that means you're going to use it like this. One big H would mean you have it. If you see somebody who has it whose parents don't, it's a recessive trait, and the only way to be affected is urine and recessive, depending on if it's sex-linked or not. Again, here's an example. You have a pedigree here. It's already shown you genotypes, but pretending these weren't here. All right, what you would see is there is one, two females co colored in to only one male colored in. So there's more females. It would be autosomal, which is why you don't see any X's or Y's in the genotypes. And then... These two children have it, but their parents don't. So that makes it a recessive trait. So they have to be homozygous recessive to be affected. And in this instance, you can see that each parent then, since they're not affected, must be a carrier to give it to their children. If it was autosomal dominant, again, we're looking at, let's see, one, two, three males affected, one, two, three females affected. That's 50-50. It can't be sex-linked. And then every person who has it, starting down here, have at least one parent who has it. This individual here also has it. That's a sibling of this male. Well, at least one of their parents, again, has to have it. In this instance, both parents have it, which is really unlikely depending on what the trait is. The reason why this individual here is a question mark is, let's pretend that mom gave this daughter the dominant allele, well, what did dad give? You're not really sure until this female here would just start having children of her own. So here's a sex-linked example. This would be X-linked recessive, because I have at least a one, two, three males to one female ratio, so it's sex-linked. And in this instance, it's going to be recessive because this male here has parents who don't have it. If you forgot about him and just looked here, it would look dominant because this person has a parent who has it. But this female, this isn't her dad, so don't be tricked. All right, so you have to see it in every generation for it to be dominant. So let's put that to the test right here. Let's look at this pedigree. Individuals in red are affected. 
So let's figure out, is it sex-linked or is it autosomal? So let's count. We have one, two, three males affected. We have one, two, three, four females affected. There's more females than males affected, so this will be autosomal. Is it dominant or recessive? Well, let's look at the people who have it. This individual affected has a parent affected. This individual has a parent affected. This individual has a parent affected. This individual has a parent affected. These two affected have a parent who's affected. So it is an autosomal dominant trait. What that means is every individual here on this pedigree now is normal, and they have to be homozygous recessive. That means everybody else who's affected has at least one dominant allele. What their second allele is, well, that takes a little detective work. So for example, and down below, we have this daughter who's affected, All right? She got that from dad. We know she is affected but heterozygous because mom could have only given her a lowercase r. This son over here is normal, All right? So she had to get, or I'm sorry, he had to get a little r from mom, either one, but they have a second little r to make them normal. That means this dad up here is actually heterozygous. So it's a little detective work looking at each generation. Let's look at another one here. So I'm looking at this pedigree. I have one, two, three males affected. I have no females affected. So this needs to be a sex-linked trait. So that means you're going to have to use X's and Y's in your genotypes. Next, is it a dominant or recessive trait? Well, individual four is affected, but their parents or not. So automatically it's recessive. So that means for a male to be affected, I'll use R's again, they would have to be this. For a female to be affected, she would have to be this. So you could take the time and go through and figure out what all the genotypes of these individuals are. So for example, since we know it's sex-linked recessive, any male who's not colored in is automatically this genotype, every single one. Any male who is affected has to be recessive. So the tough part is going to be the females. Every female here is not affected, which means they are at least X, big R, X, well, I'm not too sure what the other one is. I have to look at their children. Well, she has a son who's affected. All right. Males always will make the, their daughters affected or carriers. It's the females who give it to their sons. So if she has a son who's affected, that means she had to be a carrier or heterozygous. Now, the trick here is the females know that they are a carrier. They have to have at least one son who's affected. If they don't, don't automatically assume that they are this genotype. Excuse me. So, for example, this female down here, she's marrying into the family. I know she's normal, but I don't know what her second allele is. I might want to jump the gun and think she's this, but there's no guarantees. So, I have to look at her children. If she has any males affected, so here's her children. If she had any males affected, there would be one male colored in, and I would know she's a carrier. That's not the case. If she were to have any daughters affected, well, she would have had to have given at least one of the exes to her children, so then she would also be a carrier. <coughs> Excuse me again. All right, so here's the rule. The only way to know if a female is fully homozygous dominant is if she has four or more normal boys. Otherwise, if she doesn't, like in this case, you're going to put a big fat question mark for her second allele. All right, so it's going to take a little work. It's going to take a little practice, but do me a favor. If you have any questions, reach out to me as you work through your problems this week, and I'll get back to you as soon as I can. Thank you very much.